Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Avram Alpert. He's a writer and educator. He's a fellow at the New Institute in Hamburg and has taught at Princeton and Rutgers. He's also written for publications including Aon, The New York Times, Washington Post, Truthout, and The Brooklyn Rail. And he's the author of Global Origins of the Modern Self from Montaigne to Suzuki, A Partial Enlightenment, What Modern Literature and Buddhism Can Teach Us About Living Well Without Perfection. And his newest book is called The Good Enough Life. Welcome, Avram. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, man. And so what I love so much about this book is it gives you such a different perspective than what we're used to. So it's like, uh, you know, when we think about what it means to sort of be successful and what we think about what it means to live a good life, we often think of the merit meritocratic ideals, right? And it's like, it's so easy for us to defend meritocracy because it seems super egalitarian and like it applies or could at least, in, obviously in theory, mm -hmm. apply and should apply to everybody. But it's interesting because you have such a different perspective of that, right? So before we even get to meritocracy, I want to actually read a passage of yours on the competition itself, which again, another ideal based on the meritocratic ideal of, you know, egalitarianism and sort of equality for all and the equality of opportunity for all. Mm. So in this case, Avi writes, let's start with the very premise, a competition. There is little evidence that competition brings out the best in us. In fact, according to some studies, competition decreases our performance because it distracts us from doing the thing we want to do, play our instrument, and instead focuses us on an external goal, winning. In the very act of seeking the best, we are already no longer taking, talking about the best flautist. We are talking about the person who plays the flute best under conditions of pressure and performance. We are finding the best competitor, not the best flute player. These are not the same thing. One study of children making art, for example, found that those who were told that they were in a competition to win made much more formulaic and state art because they thought it was more likely to win. Those who were just told to paint made more creative and aesthetically powerful projects. So I love that, man. That is so like fucking amazing. So it kind of brings me back. There's a there's a sort of Rick Rubin quote, who is uh, the famous the founder from Def Jam Records. And he said something along the lines of um, he said, you know, when we think of great art, great art of essentially it's it's divisive, right? So it's like people either kind of love it or hate it. If it's popular, it's probably pretty mediocre. And that sort of gets at the heart to it, at the heart at it, right? Because when we think of competition, we often think it does bring out the best of us. And it sort of makes us, um, it brings out innovations and it makes us the best that we possibly can be in the, obviously in kind of different domains. But in this case, what you're saying is actually no, if you're thinking about kind of homogeny and you're thinking about sort of, uh, let's say stasis, that's actually what competition in terms of the winner take all modality, that's what competition brings, right? So it's not not that competition is innovative it's actually the opposite competition is stifling and when you think about and talk about the good enough life you're actually saying that competition is in some way especially at its extreme is counterproductive so super interesting can you talk about that sure no yeah i, I mean you said it very well yourself so i you know i don't need to compete to to say better what you put so well uh but no we can we can cooperate on on developing the idea and i should also say that um some of that work comes from a man named alfie Cohn, who's written a great book called no contest uh, a criticism of, of competition and I, I learned a lot reading reading his book but yeah i mean the the idea that competition should bring out the best in us is one that i actually find kind of strange and i know it's intuitive and it makes sense and okay you know i'm gonna to try to do my best so that I, I i you know win something i get the prize or, or whatever it might be but what are we doing when we compete we're excluding people right? the nature of competition is that some people are going to get in and some people are going to be left out and so we've already removed a fair amount of talent right especially when we're talking about competition at, at a relatively high level um you know when, when we have a lot of kind of smart or interesting people in a room uh, and we're saying we're going to try and pick from the hundred of you who are, could all equally well do this job. We're going to try and get the best one. We're actually getting rid of 99% of the talent in the room. Right? There's something very strange to me about that way of thinking about things. I understand there's, there's economies around this, and there's you know we can't you know, not everyone can have a voice about everything. But we could think about how do we get more people in the room, distribute things a little bit more evenly, and then how can we reduce then some of the the downsides of competition? Not just that it may may stifle creativity. Um, or, or kind of pull down innovation um, by, by, you know, kind of going through the standard metrics, but also just the, the stress and the burnout uh, and the constant sense that if you don't make it through this competition, you know, you're not going to be able to make a decent living or, or have a decent life. 
Um, and and the you know I, I think the number of studies of anxious teenagers, of depressed teenagers, adults, I mean, we all feel it. I think a little bit this constant sense of, of competition in society. And so I think it's a double loss, right? It's not like I'm saying let's get rid of competition because it just makes us kind of sad. I think we're losing a lot. We're we're missing out on this cooperative, innovative behaviors that we could could generate by being more free, being more creative, working more together, drawing on different insights. Um, but also we're causing all this, this damage to ourselves. And this is, you know, to get back to some of the, I can segue a bit into the meritocracy points as well, mm. that what happens again here is that we're also only ever rewarding very specific talents, right? We're rewarding people who think a particular way or who can use their bodies in a particular way, um, but people who do the kinds of things that make societies function um, build buildings, deliver food, uh, care for the aged, care for the, like a lot of these things um, are, are not available in a meritocratic worldview. And so they're not able to be valued in a meritocratic worldview. And if we're just saying, you know, it's about, okay, you have opportunity and you can rise through the ranks and that makes it fair because anybody can do it. I mean, one, we know that that's not true and it's not really achievable, right? But even if it were, we'd be excluding so many of the wonderful things that human beings do for each other uh, and the ways that societies work and glue and hold together. So I, it's similar for me with competition. It's this way of, of viewing the world that can only measure such a small aspect of what actually makes our lives kind of fun and enjoyable and, and joyous and caring. Um, so that, those are the, the various ways that I've, I've been thinking about this. None of that to say that you know, competition can be fun sometimes, right? Maybe you get together with some friends and you play sports or you like watching sports on TV. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, Cohen makes a much stronger kind of anti-competition argument that I do. I just think it's kind of spread everywhere. It's gone too much and the rewards are too high um, for winning and the losses are, are too great for, for kind of getting left out of these things. Um, and it's also not to say that you shouldn't explore your merit, right? If you have, to, if you're good at, you know, talking to people and you like running a podcast, you should do that as well as you can, by all means. Um, but you shouldn't feel like if you don't do that the best of all the people, you know, then you shouldn't make one at all or, or you know, your podcast isn't good enough or what, you know, it's like, no, no, like we all actually have these really amazing talents and abilities. And the more of that that we can get out there, the more venues and the more pathways and, and the more kinds of engagements, it opens up the world, it creates more democratic potential, it brings more voices onto the scene. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the kind of world that I, I at least want to live in, more so than one where I'm constantly having to kind of prove myself in these various competitions. And in that process, even if I succeed, I've lost because I've lost my kind of humanity, my kind of human connections to all the other people who, who are being left out in that process. So it's a somewhat broad answer to your question, but you hopefully get used to this. I kind of think in somewhat broad terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it seems to me that the the problem isn't striving for greatness. It's just that the fact that society is structured around encouraging that the greatest of us get rewarded the most. And it sort of disregards all these other people who are contributing and still offering value. So then in that case, um, how could we maybe better think about maybe how to structure society in a way that rewards people who generally offer value instead of the best of us who offer the most value right. or or that we think offer the most yeah. value rather yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean i would say it's slightly slightly differently just that yeah. it's not um it's not about striving for well i'm okay with striving for excellence right or, or, or striving to kind of do what you do kind of as well as you can and recognizing even within that the certain limits and that you shouldn't Break your body doing that you shouldn't stress yourself out all the time doing that when I, when I say greatness and when I talk in the book about greatness I sort of mean more the system right the system that says there are some people who are really the best and our whole world should be geared around finding them supporting them giving them everything and and somehow that's meant to benefit the rest of us and and we could talk more about that and there's some logic for that but I think it runs out but in theory, right, everyone can be excellent. Like every, everyone who, who takes the time and the energy and the care to pursue what they're good at or interested in, right, they, they can achieve some kind of excellence and you know, maybe not comparative excellence, but really develop their, their virtues and their talents. And so, so that, that's more kind of what I'm interested in. Um, in terms of how we structure society, I mean, there's so, there's so many things I think we could do. 
Um, one, so there's a kind of philosophical level here, right? There's a way in which we think about what it means to, to have virtue or, or have, have um, decency or, you know, like what is, what is the main value that we care about in life? And if we think philosophically, well, the, the main value that we care about in life is right, being the best, right? It's kind of someone kind of achieving or achievement or success or something like that. I think that pulls the system out of whack. Uh, because again, it's a relative measure, right? Achievement, success are always going to be relative measures. And so if some people are succeeding, some other people are not. That's just sort right. of the definition of the term. It's zero sum. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and what it doesn't, right? The world doesn't have to be that way. It can be a little bit, right? Some people are going to do something that maybe gets them a little more attention or, um, I don't know, you know, makes our lives a little bit easier and maybe you get a bit of a reward for that. But the reward really, you know, in my maybe naive but somewhat hopeful vision is that improving the world is a pretty good reward, right? Like helping people live a better life is a pretty good reward. Having a third vacation home is just actually not that exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but that maybe, I don't know, we could talk more about that. But so, so, so there's some kind of economic questions uh, around this and right, how do we incentivize them? So if, if our philosophy shifts so that we're thinking not how do you be the best, but right, how do you help contribute to a world that is decent, meaningful, caring, sufficient for everyone? It's the kind of good enough world that I'm talking about. Then, you know, that, that could be, um, it could shift our perspective and then we could think about reward differently, right? So again, it's not that you came up with this invention and it did these sets of things. And so you get to extract all of this monetary value from it. But you did this amazing thing and, you know, thank you. <laughs> and like, you've made right, our lives better. You've made people healthier. You've, you've made energy differently. And you don't need to have obscene rewards for that because everyone is doing kind of okay, right? Not, again, not amazing, but, but decently. And maybe again, yeah, you get a little extra, maybe get one vacation home. But again, I, I don't, I want us to think about a world where if you have a little bit more than someone, it's not so bad. But if you have so much, when people literally cannot eat, um, don't have clean air, don't have clean drinking water, I don't see the value. I don't see the reward in that. That seems to me relatively out of whack. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's other things, you know, we can kind of go through the different layers of this, but even in a more egalitarian society, right, there is what's called the attention economy or the positional economy. And the ways in which award or esteem are, are generated. And this is actually sometimes a little bit harder. I mean, it's not politically harder, but it's conceptually a little bit harder to deal with because while we can actually, we do grow enough food to, to feed everybody and, and we could have enough teachers to educate everybody, we can't really have more awards or we can't have more attention, right? Attention is actually a, a, it's a finite concept. You can expand it some, right? And, and what you guys do or what Chris Boutte we were talking about earlier, you know, people who really get out there, read a lot of books, talk to a lot of authors, you expand the attention economy, right? You really do. You bring in other voices and, and you help engage. And it's, it's been really fun doing all these, these podcasts. Um, but there is eventually, right, there are finite limits, especially if we, we sort of say, you know, what, you know, you, you can only read so many books in your life, right? Which books do you read? Some are going to get left out, right? Some are going to become more popular than others. Mm -hmm. But we can think about how do you, how do you limit that a little bit? You know, how do you have a, um, a bit more understanding that things that are not deemed classic actually are full of insight? Um, sometimes, uh, as, as you, you were saying a moment ago, right, what's popular is actually kind of what's mediocre because it hits this kind of... Um, particular space uh, and that and that you know we at least understand that and again where we can't manage to extend our attention and our appreciation of people we at least know that people are not losing out in life because of right they're not suffering because of that they're not unable to eat. I mean they're suffering again it's called the good enough life because it can't be perfect so we're going to suffer somewhat it's going to be a little sad there's going to be tragedy we're going to we're going to you know have unrequited love there's going to be accidents this is this is uh, inevitable, um, but we can, you know, kind of put as much as we can, we can say there's accidental suffering and there's the suffering that we create through our inability to properly distribute esteem, reward, care in society. Um, so those, I, yeah, it happens at, to answer your, your, your question, Alan, it, like, it happens at a few mm. layers in, in society. Um, and mm. I try to trace those through in the book, individual, interpersonal, political. Yeah. So what's, what was interesting to me is uh, it kind of got me thinking about, again, going back to meritocracy and how it kind of differs from your book. So when we think of meritocracy, it's very kind of idealized where, again, it's like this pure system that people rise through just based on their own efforts and just, you know, it's kind of just sheer will. Right. And I remember thinking I had a, I had a conversation with one of my graduate professors like way back when, and I said to him, you know, 
I said, IQ tests are like kind of weird, right? Because I was like, you know, they sort of hide a lot if you think about it. Because I was like, what happens if somebody has like test anxiety and that day like she or he goes and takes the IQ test and then they kind of bomb it, right? Um, and we were talking about Richard Feynman, actually. So Richard Feynman, who's like a complete genius, right? And so he actually bombed all of his IQ tests when he was a kid. And so my professor was like, look, man, he's like, IQ tests are literally, they're legit, right? Like they're pretty stable or they show stability over one's lifetime, right? Which is obviously true. But I was like, okay, but what about the fact that he like, he failed? this IQ test, right? He's like, well, he could have not given a shit. He could have been anxious, whatever. Right. And I was like, okay, but when you're looking at these confounding factors, right, aren't they important? Because like, let's say you're in a school, right? And again, going back to the ideal of meritocracy, you're in a school, you're given an IQ test, right? Let's say your IQ is like, I don't know, a hundred or 80 something. And then, you know, whoever's administering it shares it with your teachers and your teachers is like, oh, that's his IQ. Eh, we're going to give him a little less attention. And we're going to give a little more attention to people with higher IQs. Right. But then, and then going back to the the conversation with my professor, I was like, but what if, right? If let's say if somehow this person weren't anxious, right? And let's say his true IQ, whatever, you know, that would be all kind of manifest, right? And then, you know, that affects his life. And then the teacher looks at it and it's a completely different result. And she is like, oh my God, like I have to now give more attention to this kid. And, you know, that sort of changes almost the entire trajectory of that kid's life. And so my professor's response was like, he's like, yeah, but it's still fair, right? And I was like, okay, but how? And he says, because if everybody has anxiety while they're taking these IQ tests, I mean, that's just how it is. If he has anxiety while taking it, then the next kid has anxiety and he's taking it, then the next kid and so on. I was like, wait, but no, but that's not true because we have different levels of anxiety, right? So some people have anxiety disorders. Some people have like your base level of anxiety. Some people are psychopaths and don't have any anxiety whatsoever. So to say like, well, it's fair in the sense of like, well, everybody's anxious, right? So it's like, it's sort of like, um, it sort of evens it out. It's not really a confounding variable because at the end of the day, again, egalitarianism sort of reigns because the next kid is going to have anxiety too. And I'm like, no, but that's not true. So, and I could even think about like clients of mine. So I have like one kid that I see who's literally like a genius, but he has severe test anxiety. So when it comes to doing essays, he just like, he's phenomenal. He aces it. But when it comes to taking tests, he gets like fifties and sixties because he freaks out and just panics. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, but imagine a system, especially when you're a kid and you're only really taking tests, essays aren't as prominent as they are in college. Then what happens to that kid when he's like kind of left aside and you know, all of the attention again, going back to the kind of positional or attention economy is placed on these people who are good test takers. So it kind of puts a hole in that meritocratic ideal of like, well, it's fair for everybody because it doesn't seem that way. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And I think the point that you're making is, is really fundamental to one of the part of the argument of the book that um, when you win something, right, if you do well an IQ test or you win a literary award or you get into a particular school, um, first of all, especially with some of those later things, right, we know from college admissions, we know from the, uh, the offices of college admissions that they reject many more qualified applicants um, than they receive. But if you get into right, a particular fancy school, you then have that with you forever. And you got in by luck. I mean, you got in by effort up to a point and skill and what have you. But that last step, if there were 10,000 qualified applicants and they only took 1,000, right, you're part of this kind of smaller niche that... Um, that then you'll keep getting more and more benefits from, right? And then you win something after that, and you know it keeps going. And they, they, you know, they call this the Matthew effect, this idea that um, from from the book of Matthew, the the parable of the talents, and you know, one worker doesn't get any interest for his his master, and um, when the master comes back, says, you know, I'm I'm going to take away from you even the one the one ta talent being a, a unit, um, you know, the one kind of uh, bit of money I gave you and and the and then saying to him well um you know whoever has will get more and whoever doesn't have will have it taken away and this is I think the problem you're talking about with the student who has that first IQ test go wrong is that right they they did what they did and for any number of reasons beyond actually their intelligence and therefore they right they had um, everything taken away. They didn't get the time, they didn't get the energy, they didn't get the effort, and so they didn't keep growing in the same way. And I mean, I think there's other complexities with IQ tests. Uh, look, we can measure lots of things, and I think it's important that we measure some things better, right? We can help people with anxiety to take tests better, uh, either through medication or time. Um, some of that may be insurmountable, and so that, that's also something really to recognize. Um, so I think it's, it's a bit of a balance there, but also to say that IQ really, you know, I, I think people who live in the world know this, right? Like you can have the highest IQ, but you can be a completely unbearable person to work with or live with. 
um, you know, you can master a, a million languages and every coding language in the world and be a super genius, but then, you know, go around and make everyone else's lives miserable and not have an ethical compass, right? There are many different kinds of intelligences we need. So even if we get a good metric, uh, we still can't really measure the complexity and depth of, of a, a human being. And I think, I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm, I don't know, <laughs> I'm naive, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm a bit sappy sometimes, but like, I, I do really believe that people put in the right conditions with the right care, with the right concern, um, will make mistakes, but also have potentials. And if we kind of, we, we live in a world that respects and cares for as many of us as, as possible, um, we will get more genuine goodness, creativity, innovation out of people, and including people, right, who, who like you're saying, Leon, don't test well, right? Their, their goodness will not ever appear in something we can measure, either because it's hidden behind anxiety or because it just doesn't manifest um, in a series of logical questions. Uh, and I just, I like you, I don't really, or at least what I'm hearing from you, I don't really understand the, the benefit to, to society of doing things in that way. I, you know, I can see some of it and I can totally understand that yeah, like intelligent people, people who have good logical, uh, mathematical abilities are able to build, you know, the kind of thing that we're speaking through right now. I could never build a Zoom system, right? Um, and I, you know, we can appreciate that without saying, well, therefore, if you don't have that kind of skill, uh, whether because we never found it or you just, you don't have, I don't have this kind of ability, uh, you know, I don't, maybe you guys are, are better at this kind of thing than I am, but just because you don't have it means that you should should not have right a really fulfilling and meaningful life in which you don't have to feel inadequate or less than anyone else because you didn't um we weren't born with these particular skills or you didn't have the opportunities to express and explore them um, which again even in a in a good a good world i don't think that's the world that we really live in but even in a world that really supports and cares for everyone some things are going to get missed some people are going to have you know opportunities lost or they're not going to be able to you know, the anxiety is going to mask whatever they're good at. Um, and I think that should just be okay, you know, and, and if it's okay, I think people also be less anxious. Like, I think this is somewhat of a correcting mechanism. If your whole life, if you're not told, like, if you don't get a 120 or whatever on this IQ test, you're never going to get a good school. You're never going to get a good job. And, you know, you might as well just, I don't know, um, give up now. Then, of course, you're going to have extra stress or anxiety uh, around this. So some of it is genetic. I mean, I'm not saying we can get rid of all, all human quirks this way, but I think we can ameliorate some things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also people in general, uh, depending on the context, they can contribute very like meaningful value in, it doesn't have to be in the context of an IQ test. Like for example, Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he didn't contribute value in that particular context, he was still ma managed to find, at least for himself, his own, uh, his own version of success, or at least, you know, yeah, what's interesting about him, by the way, since yeah, you mentioned that he was actually a super contrarian. So the reason why I think the thinking is why he didn't like do well on the IQ test is he legitimately just didn't care. Like he was such a genius and so opposed to just like public structures that he wanted nothing to do with it up until I mean, at some point high school or whatever it was, where he decided, okay, I guess I'll like give this system a shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, what's so interesting is that mm -hmm. since we uh, brought up podcasting, so um, it, Avi, I was, uh, I was actually more kind of in terms of like, when I was reading your book, I really identified with the students that you kind of talked about. So it would, especially in the realm of podcasting, where it's like, when you said um, something along the lines of like, when you're trying to kind of talk about this worldview with your students, they're kind of resistant about it. And they're sort of fo focused on greatness, where even though they're listening, and obviously receptive of it, they're still in the back of their minds thinking, well, but this is the world I'm in. And I still have to succeed so what's interesting is that he and i differ in this respect too so i'm like really aggressive with podcasting and i'm like really metric space whereas alan is always thinking about like okay but like what value are we providing people mm -hmm. so and yeah go ahead. I, I feel like that that should be the most important thing. it should be it should be yeah i mean ideally if i mean of course we should care about metrics how many people we reach and mm -hmm. that's why i think that's incredibly valuable to think about for sure but definitely you want to think about what value you're contributing what is it that you want people to know about do you want them to know more about uh critical thinking nuanced thinking uh when are you projecting what what are these cognitive biases we may have uh what is the ego uh what is you know when are you uh backwards rationalizing what are is are these emotions that you feel uh 
uh, oh, sorry, are, are the thoughts that you think just uh, maybe ruminating intrusive thoughts? Or are they actually thoughts that come to you in a moment of brainstorming? How do you discern what what's what, you know, the different things are valuable. And when you think about telling people about things like that, it, I mean, it feels more, I don't know, it just kind of rolls off the tongue uh, more when you think about metrics, and these goals that you have to meet, I feel like I don't know what kind of, I don't feel like we produce the authentic content that we want to talk about, which is interesting. And I would assume, Avi, that's also kind of your perspective when it comes to creativity, too, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I understand where both of you are coming from. I think my, you know, my sensibility is, is a bit more in, in this realm of let's do the best we can do. And, you know, one, because I think that's all we can do at the end of the day. Uh, you can't, you can't will your metrics to be different, right? You just do, all you can do is, is do what you're, you're good at, what you care about. And there are ways in which I think once you start to care too much about those other things, you lose sight, right? It's like, well, what we really think is important are all the kinds of attributes of, of psychological and, and, and critical rationality that, that uh, Alan was just listing. Um, but if we really want our podcast to grow by 10,000 users, we need more, you know, like potty humor, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, that probably doesn't quite fit with it. Maybe you get the, or you, I don't know, I don't know what you need. I'm not a podcaster, but whatever you need, right, to get that, that extra bump um, may not fit with exactly what, you know, you want to do. And I think this is really my concern. And, and that's what I see with my students is that they, well, I mean, I'm not teaching now, but when, when I taught at Princeton, you know, you have these very... I mean, they're very earnest, right? They really want to like make the world a better place. And they, they're really upset about climate change and inequality. And, and a lot of them come from, you know, increasingly now diverse backgrounds, diverse uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, but nevertheless, right, you sort of say to them, well, what do you want to do when you leave here? And they say, well, for the first five to 10 years, I, I will have to make about 150 to $200,000 a year because then I can kind of have my nest egg and then I can... Um, whatever, you know, I can buy a house, you know, and you can't afford to buy a home in Princeton if you don't make that much money, blah, blah, blah. And so they feel, you know, and then of course, for the most part, they never leave, right? They, they start on that job path and then it's a, you know, what do they call it? The golden handcuffs, right? You just sort of get deeper and deeper into that. And so that's that's the, the and it's hard for me to to say to them, well, you know, do, do what I, like, if you want to, you know, pursue a, a life of, of learning and, and um, education and, you know, because uh, I, you know, it's like, like I am from year to year kind of looking for fellowship to fellowship. I teach writing here sometimes. I do something else sometimes. Um, I, I love my life. Like I would not trade it for, for golden handcuffs by any stretch of the imagination. But there are certainly days like you, Leon, where I'm like, or I mean, sorry, not you in terms of money, but you in terms of the metric, like the metrics catch up to me. I'm like, well, if I had done, you know, if I'd gone and made a little money at some point in my life, I wouldn't be dealing with all these issues now. Um, and that's why I think leaving this up to individuals is, it's a lot, it's very demanding to ask. And those students are not responding to what they want. They're not responding, they're not, they're, it's not like they're saying, I want to be super wealthy. That's not actually the interest, right? They actually want to be kind of passionate and complex human beings who, who make other people's lives better. Um, but what they're they're told is that, okay, in this society, the best you can do is to make a lot of money. And in doing that, you know, maybe on the back end, you're making value and it's going to kind of trickle down and, and it'll help people in a kind of roundabout way. And don't worry about how you make the money. And if people lose their homes in the process, that's all kind of put that behind the scenes, you'll fix it later. Um, and so I, I, I think though, it's not, it's not fair though, just to say to them, well, you guys have to be the ones who, who don't do that, right? You have to be the generation that, that gives up on that. Uh, we have to kind of more collectively say, this is the direction that we should, you know, I, have, I don't think nudging is the best idea, but in a sense, right, we should kind of nudge ourselves and society is towards, we make uh, a world that in, in which you can project yourself to being someone who doesn't make that much money, but lives a rich and meaningful life and is able to afford healthcare and education and raising children and retirement. And, you know, if you ask, there's an amazing survey done in the 19... 50s, late 1940s of um, British high school children. And if you ask them, when, when they ask them, would you rather, you know, make a lot of money, but do an uh, un meaningless job or not make that much money, but have a meaningful job, like 80% say meaningful job, don't care about the money. 
Um, when I asked my students this question very unscientifically, but a group of 22 of them at the end of the last semester, um, two, two said they wanted to have an interesting job and all the rest of them said they just wanted to make a lot of money. And it was interesting. And I think part of it is that, you know, if you're a British, um, you're in, in 1950s England, right? You know that you've just, they've just developed a public well being system. Right? There's healthcare, there's housing, there's retirement pension. Like they've actually made it so that you don't have to make that much money. So you can go be a school teacher, um, go be a, a security member of your, your community. Um, you can be a, a person who, who collects the, the trash, right? But you're still going to have, you know, you're going to have your life and you're going to have your family and you're going to be able to do the kinds of things you want to do. Mm -hmm. And my students today were really just sort of saying, well, if I were making a million dollars a year, like my life would just be good. Like they, they couldn't even comprehend the idea that there was a contradiction between making a lot of money um, and living a meaningful life because those two things have become so kind of mushed together in, in their minds. And unmushing that, <laughs> kind of taking those things back apart and where you find meaning is why I write the book. But I totally hear, so it's a very long answer to your, your question, but I, I really hear where both of you are coming from. Like I, I definitely understand it is at some level, right? We live in a world that pushes us toward thinking about metrics, that pushes us to think about particular kinds of value. And we can try to step out of that, but we have to understand, right? There are kind of limitations or things we won't be able to do because of that. Luckily, I think, you know, this is a more or less free, like, you, you know, you guys can do this out of, out of interest, right? You're not, I don't know. I mean, you're, there's opportunity costs and things, um, but, you know, you are able to, to pursue this and that, that, that's, that's not, nice. I mean, that is something that I think, you know, is nice about one of the nice features of the internet, um, to, <laughs> although there are many less nice features today. <laughs> but what's so what I love so much is that if you kind of look at it on the surface, it seems like like your work is idealistic and sort of the way that we live reality now, right? Like the hedonic treadmill is that's what reality actually is. But if you kind of think about it a little deeper, it's actually the opposite, I think. So you and I want to talk about this too in a couple of minutes or whatever. Um, like you talk about the problems with the good enough life, right? And how like issues are still going to come up and how it's definitely not going to be perfect. But if you think about it, if you think of the hedonic treadmill, that's actually idealistic thinking. So again, going back to Rick Rubin, and I'm only talking about him just because I finally watched uh, the Shangri-La documentary on his life. Um, he has a, I forgot who the artist was that he was talking to, but the artist is like, yeah, man, he's like, you know, like, it's crazy, but I have like all of these fans and all this money and I'm somehow still unhappy. And Rubin says to him, he's like, yeah, you ever noticed that? Like how everything is kind of inherently kind of just unsatisfying. Like you think, oh man, what's that? And you said this too one time where you were like, oh, I'll be happy when, right? And he's like, you know, and so going back to Rubin and he said, yeah, he's like, you ever noticed that when you start thinking about all of these things that are going to make you happy, you know, money, fame, uh, you know, women, obviously, if that's what you're into, uh, you know, kind of notoriety or whatever, it doesn't, right? He's like, somehow or other, you start with this void, you start with this emptiness, then, you know, if you're one in a million people that finally gets to the top, right? Because he's like, the rest of them are just chasing. But if you're finally that if you're the one that one person that like finally gets to the top, you're like, Oh, my God, I still have that void today is exactly like it was yesterday. And so what I love about your work is that you actually invoke a concept from Robert Wright, who wrote what, um, why Buddhism is true and the concept of inherent dukkha, right? Inherent unsatisfactoriness. That the idea is essentially that here are these people on the hedonic treadmill who are chasing the top will probably never reach it because, again, one in a million, they don't really know that, right? They're idealizing what a future could look like. How they become a famous musician, had they become an actor, actress, whatever, right? But they don't really know. But then you have these other people, again, going back to Ruben, right, who reached it and they're like, oh no, the void is still there. Sorry, but it doesn't just disappear. And then you come in and you're like, hey, yeah, Robert Wright was talking about this. Buddha was talking about this. The understanding of life is fundamentally, you might enjoy kind of success for whatever amount of time, but it's very limited. At some point, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe even a year, you're going to be like, yeah, okay, what's next? What's, you know, how is this not actually like completely transform my well being because it just doesn't do that yeah, yeah plus, plus you are tr technically training your brain to say i'll be happy when this mm -hmm. result happens so then when you do get to that result you have now basically trained your brain to still be happy when something occurs mm -hmm. so when that moment comes and it's always been this moment quote unquote oh you're saying <laughs> that you get yourself into a future oriented mindset and then they then you can't just get out of it when you reach whatever the goal is yeah you could even oh, make yeah you can make a neurological argument for that you're you're wiring your syn synapses to just be happy when when you have this uh goal that you're uh striving towards but when you actually reach that goal you've still programmed your brain to look for a goal 
for you to be happy when that goal it's it's like a vicious cycle which is why that's actually dope i never thought about it yeah plus anyway arguably thinking although this is like something that you can't necessarily intellectually understand yeah i mean you could try but it's just like uh yeah if if you're going to be happy when something occurs or during this of a particular moment but anyway right now it's also the moment yeah right? which i know is a little esoteric right but mm. technically speaking there's no reason you shouldn't be happy now and also simultaneously yeah. you know striving for things yeah because it's like that moment is still imperfect just like as the last moment and the moment before that right yeah so why not just enjoy now instead yeah. of wait to enjoy yeah, yeah. and, and Avi, can you talk a little bit about kind of what you got from robert wright and how obviously when we think about unsatisfactoriness you can't just overcome it by success and even becoming great and why even greatness and again great people experience that same state of dukkha everybody else does yeah 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 sure no and i also i appreciate what you're saying ellen this um this always yeah that you train yourself and that makes a lot of sense because i say this to myself all the time too like I'm like, I've got this fellowship in Hamburg now, and then I've got to like go get something else after this. And if I could just have like a kind of settled place, like then I'll be happy. But of course, that's not going to work that way for all, all the reasons that you're discussing, right? Part of that is that, you know, you get into the mindset, which is always future oriented. Um, but also, if you can't be happy in the moment in which, which you exist, um, you, you know, there's not going to be, it's not going to happen when something else, because the, the void of existence, and this is right, this is Dukkha, right? Is, is permanent, right? There is in the nature of being human, we are unhappy at some level, right? We can be more or less happy. We can be more or less unhappy. We can we can go into levels of, of depression and, and lack of well-being, which are very serious and, and um, need to be worked through. But there is no moment in our lives that it ends, right? Our life doesn't end, it keeps going. And, and, and this is, so, so Robert Wright's idea is, is quite interesting. He, he wrote this, yeah, this why Buddhism is true. And he basically says, Buddhism maps really well onto the process of natural selection. And, and the basic idea of natural selection is that, you know, um, nature doesn't, uh, there's no way to say this exactly correctly, right? Nature doesn't actually want anything, but effectively, right, when nature, wants is for us to keep living what our human nature wants is to keep going and so how do you do that well you, you survive by eating enough uh and you know you have sex to, to procreate and, and push on to the next generation and so how do you get someone to keep eating and how do you get someone to keep trying to procreate well so right has this i think very simple point which is you know you have to not be happy after you do it you have to want to do it you have to enjoy doing it and then you have to be miserable and this is the, and so then, okay, then it starts the, the cycle again, right? The, the hedonic cycle. And it makes, it makes a fair amount of sense. I mean, I think, I don't, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I think some people have disputed some of the details, but, but you, the basic principle, I think, works pretty well, right? Like we, we, we want something, we get it, we're unhappy. Whether that's because of evolution or some other kind of just random quirk, I, I don't really know. But that does fit relatively nicely onto the kind of the classical Buddhist message. Right, which is, and it's it's very amazingly phrased in some of the texts, but right, pleasure is suffering, right? Pleasure is, it's not that like you, it's not even temporal in the same way. It's just that in that moment, in the moment in which you experience pleasure, there is also that knowledge that this pleasure will go away. And that loss is always going to be there with you, even in that moment in which you kind of grasp something or feel something good or have an achievement. Um, so it can be as simple as, you know, getting the meal you wanted because you were hungry, um, and, it, and it can be as complicated as, right, becoming the, the number one billboard chart, whatever. Uh, but any of those things are also, you're going to know at that moment, in the next moment, that feeling is going to go away. Right? That, that, that kind of sense of completeness will not last. That's just not what life is. It's this ongoing kind of struggle. And so, one of the, one of the things that, that Wright gets and that you can, you can interpret some of Buddhism as saying is, you can arguably get out of that cycle, but at the very least you can diminish it. Um, so, so whether or not there is such a thing as kind of in this life nirvana in which you're, you are kind of outside of this whole system and cycle is, is somewhat debated, but it's certainly true that if you, if you stop wanting, right, if you kind of work less on thinking about your life, I said work more on, on um, I'm not sure I'm saying this right, but if you if you try and find a way in which you are not focused on fulfilling lack, right, but you kind of understand that part of what life is is lack, and that part of life is always going to be 
um, unsatisfactory, you will not grasp at satisfaction. And as you stop grasping at satisfaction, you will be able to kind of just appreciate the fact that this is what it is, right? And you, you'll you'll lose, you'll you won't lose, right? Some degree of suffering, which is just kind of being alive, but you right. will lose that extra suffering that we put on when we grasp, when we try to kind of hold things and and follow our craving. Yeah, sorry. To you. No, no, it's actually to, uh, so this actually reminds me of something you wrote about in the book uh, relating to Alan Watts and the backwards law. I think it relates to what you're talking about. Um, could you describe the backwards law in in, ter- in relation to um, that grasping that you were just uh, referring yeah, to? Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, Watts is such an interesting character. I don't know how well yeah. people know him these days, but I-, I This I, guy I, loves him. This guy I, loves him. I listen to like every single lecture, you know, yeah. yeah. The Joker, like at whatever, everything, yeah. He had such a um, he had such an amazing clarity in, in presenting these concepts, and I you know I kind of grew up or when, when I was probably seventeen or eighteen. I started reading Watts, and was just like, why didn't no one tell me? You know, like books like The Wisdom of Insecurity, which are all you know, you're an insecure teenager, and you're constantly trying to prove yourself. And he's like, no, no, just be insecure. And it, it is exactly what you're talking about, where it's how do you achieve some sense of security in the world where you just embrace the fact that you feel insecure all the time and you stop trying to get rid of it and it's like well this is a little awkward it's okay I don't mind it's just the way life is and it kind of reduces some of that tension and power I think the backwards law is a general formulation of that uh, which as a Watts fan maybe you could do do better than me but it's something along the lines of um, you know if you by by attempting to grasp something you lose it uh, and as you give up on something that's how you receive it and I think he gives it I think there's a quote from uh, also, the book of Matthew that, that kind of gives us a kind of precision in there. Um, but yeah, you know, like that that kind of idea that you can find in various traditions, but that Watts really excavates from Taoism and, and from Buddhism, that the, the path toward overcoming this craving is to stop trying to overcome it right? and to kind of step back, step out of that. And I think, you know, one of the things that interests me is that when you when I started to study, and this is what the previous book was about, when I started to study the history of Buddhism or, or go to some Buddhist countries or, or meet Buddhists, you know, you ha- I had this very romantic vision, kind of this Watsian vision, well, Buddhists have it all figured out. And as soon as I like go to Japan, everyone's just going to be like amazingly chill and Zen all the time. And of course, that's not true, right? <laughs> People exist, not they exist in the modern world, but as Buddhism tried to kind of institutionalize itself and spread, it realized like everything does that making institutions is, is really hard, right? If you have monks whose job is to meditate all the time, well, someone has to feed them and someone has to care for them. And who's that going to be? And sometimes there was a decent relationship with the community, but sometimes it was a disaster. And the monks hired like security guards in, in Tibet. They had punk monks. Um, I think it's dope dop. It, it rhymes in, in Tibetan too. Um, you know, who would go basically beat people up to get the taxes or collect the taxes and beat them up. But they had to so that they could kind of keep the monastery going. And mm-hmm. it's not to say that this is, this is like, to say Buddhism is not, oh no, I hate it, it's terrible. It's just to say it's complicated, right? And how you, you can come up with these really beautiful, insightful ideas that really, I think, explain so much about our, our minds and our well-being. Um, but if you don't connect them back up to the world and to institutions in, in a meaningful way, you'll run into these problems. And I think there are texts, uh, canonical texts in Buddhism that do really try to do that. And so I talk about some of those in the, in the book as well, the real critiques of the caste system and the idea that only some people are spiritually capable um, and that you know what, what Buddhism effectively, I mean, the strongest kind of message that I take from Buddhism is though, even though we can't end suffering, it is our task to end as much suffering as possible for as many people as possible. Um, and I, I think that's a really, it's just a kind of beautiful injunction um and and a constant one right we're always kind of going through that both that process we're talking about implementing for ourselves the kind of backwards law ungrasping and i think also understanding yeah i think there was this thing when i was younger too and i would read watts and i think oh like i get it i get zen i'll just be zen now like you just kind of will yourself to do it but of course it's incredibly hard because you have so many of these habits right and these mental patterns these future oriented or all the kind of biases that we're we're filled with um, and undoing them, and I think this is what Robert Wright is also very good at pointing out, undoing them is a complex practice of really working through the layers of the mind. Um, and I think just as we have to do that in our minds, we have to do that in our world and really kind of undo a lot of these, these pernicious systems. So that's, a, yeah, that, that was where a lot of that interest was, was coming from. And, and really just, I think the disappointment 
with kind of way that Buddhism had, had existed in history was more meaningful than just kind of having this romantic vision, like kind of realizing actually this is really hard. And that's a lot of where the good enough kind of idea started to, to brew was not just in the kind of suffering vision, but in the difficulty of what do you do with your insights? How do you make the world actually kind of function around them? That's it's a very hard question that unfortunately we still have not figured out as, as a world. Yeah. And I think it's like what we're thinking about, and I guess we would all agree here, um, is that when we're thinking about, again, if being if you're one of these few people at the top, number one, you're not going to be even satisfied initially when you get the thing. You might have some semblance of joy or some like dopamine rush, but it's going to always kind of contrast with whatever, with whatever your ideal kind of ideal vision or ideal version of that state was. And then even over time, even that level of satisfactoriness is going to kind of, you know, sort of uh, kind of wane. And then you're thinking about it, obviously, in terms of evolution. And it's like, OK, how do I survive? Right? What's the next thing? How do I kind of maintain the slot or the spot now? So I think what you're saying is, and again, I do think that we all agree on this, is that if we continue that sort of mentality, what's going to happen is you're going to constantly and chronically have, for the vast majority of people, a state of complete dissatisfaction. And then even for the people on top, it's going to be even probably a minor to maybe moderate level of satisfaction, which actually isn't even worth all of the suffering involved. So if you're thinking of cost benefit, it would make more sense for us to have a good enough life for everybody where we all have you know, and I mean, there's no real way to quantify, but let's say a moderate level of satisfaction, as opposed to some people having a mild to moderate one, and then everybody else being chronically depressed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think, as you said, too, it would work better for everybody, right? Even the people who make it to the top, right, and experience these moments. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm sure there, there are fabulously wealthy people who are also fabulously happy. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that those people exist, but that's, it's like a unicorn, you know, it's like this kind of yeah. rare person whose life kind of fell in this particular way. And we could actually just have many more people who are not only happy, but like fed and cared for um, and have a kind of decent life. And the, the lie that we tell ourselves, I mean, one of the things we, we do know, right, is that one of the things that makes people happy is actually, right, spending joyous time with other people, um, not having fear. Uh, do, contributing to the common good in, in some way. Um, money matters, right? And there's various studies of like how much money and at what point money stops mattering, you know, but money matters up to the point at which you kind of feel free to do what you want to do. Right. Um, after that point, it kind of stops, you know, so as long as you can eat and you can live in a decent home and, and um, you can be cared for and, you know, you have your basic need met, money starts to, and, you know, take vacation and things, money starts to, to matter a bit less. Um, your third or fourth home just it doesn't increase your happiness. It just increases your ecological destruction, um, your waste of space, um, you know, the ways in which anyway, I won't get into too too much of it. But um yeah, sorry, I lost my point because I went on my vacation home ramp. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, man. So yeah, I actually kind of want to focus on something else now. Um, so yeah, the thing that I find important about your book is that it's again anti-idealistic, which is to me a really great thing because I tend to struggle with like utopic thinking. I really hate it, right? Because it's it's kind of impossible. So um the point there is is that when you're thinking about, and I really want to focus specifically because this is what you focus on the book, on uh creating, let's say, a democratically socialistic state and some of the problems that come up with that and some of the problems that come up with cooperatives and sort of management in, in that. And then also when we're thinking about just like managing the economy, something that could come up with that. Yeah. So can you talk about like, obviously, first of all, why the democratic socialist ideal in your, I think this is what you're saying, that in your perspective, it seems to be the way forward. And then even still, even though that's the way forward, why it's not perfect either, but better, but better. Yeah. Yeah. No. And um, I, I kind of agree with utopianism. And I think one of the one of the quotes or one of the ideas that I found really interesting was from a man named Simon Rabidowicz, who is a literary scholar. And, and, and he says that um, he's, he's actually talking about the um, kind of refugee crisis made by the founding of the state of Israel, Israeli man. But, you know, he sort of says, how do we deal with this? Well, um, you know, either we let the refugee crisis stand or we immediately bring everybody back. Anyone who left is welcome back and we're going to figure this out right away. And he says, people tell me that's utopian. But I'll tell you what's utopian is imagining that this new state is going to survive and thrive when it's just kicked out all of these inhabitants and they're angry and they're miserable. And I think he's been proven quite right, right? Like that this didn't, you know, yes, you know, Israel was able to kind of make its state in a particular way, but at this cost of constant right, struggle, they might have had constant struggle anyway. I mean, I'm not, it's not so much about the specific example, but he's, I like his reversal of utopianism, right? And he's really sort of saying, 
what you're calling utopian is actually the utopian thing. You think you're going to be able to live in a world where this isn't going to cause problems. Um, purity. That's, that's what's utopian, right? But what's not utopian is dealing with reality. Um, and so I feel that way about our economic system at some level as well, is that people say, oh, it's, you know, utopian, you'll never, people are lazy, you'll have all these free riders if, you know, you kind of make things um, function for everybody. Um, but what seems to me utopian is to think we can keep going on in a world that is so torn apart by inequality, in which so much money is staying in so few hands and so many people are kind of angry and upset. Um, and we think that this is going to not cause problems. We think it's not going to cause political problems or divisions or ecological issues. Um, it seems to me kind of, that seems to me utopic. You're really ignoring the real world in, in that sense. And when I say that, you know, I, I try not in the book to have exactly a specific, I'm, I'm kind of open um, social democracy in that sense of, you know, largely market driven, but the needs of life taken off the market. Um, redistribution largely done through taxes, uh, I think is, is a, is a, it's worked okay in history. And if you could generalize that model, I think it has some particular issues, um, mostly that in the history of, of social democracy, it's always created underdevelopment, right? There's always been parts of the world and even within particular countries that because it still requires a kind of underclass of labors, they, they do a little better and there's kind of welfare um but they're still existing right there's still this kind of constant need for for something the democratic socialist ideal again basically says we can make a world where everyone is doing okay i mean to put it in, in i think the simplest terms no one's doing amazing um i think depending on which democratic socialist you speak with right some people will say we'll abolish money um some people will say that you know there'll be um no more than three times difference in any given company. So the CEO might make three times more than the lowest paid worker, but no more than that. Some people might say there'd just be a flat uh, economy, right? Everyone gets 50,000 units of whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to think about that. They all seem to me like they're gonna have problems, right? Like, um, how are you gonna ensure, right? That every CEO sticks to this three times thing and doesn't sneak the stock options in if you have a kind of still market socialism or something like this, or if you have no money, well, you know, what, are, what is the means by which people are going to create debt and exchange things? And if you have um, a kind of flat salary, like what happens if you run out and you haven't fed your family that year? Like there's, I just think there, there are going to be these kinds of issues. And also, um, there's still going to be life, right? There's still going to be the suffering that, that we all feel. There's still going to be people who don't love you back. There's still going to be tragedy and dismay and betrayal. Um, and there's also going to be a lot of decisions. If we have more workers cooperatives, which I think is a really good idea. And I think that laws can be, I, I don't know so much the details about this, but when I've talked to lawyers about this, they tell me, right, finance lawyers, that, um, Laws are structured to support particular models of economic development that does not really support the kind of small cooperative um, where everyone is paid more equally. It's harder to get funding for that kind of thing. Um, it's harder to, to make enough money to sustain everyone in the cooperative. There's, there's various kind of complexities, but we could shift some of those. But what we can't shift is what happens when um, there's a couple in the co-op and they decide to have a child. and so. They're spending more time raising that child and at the co-op do they still get the same you know is that decided ahead of time or do they get a little bit less but that's okay or do they get more because they have a child and the co-op has decided they're going to support everybody and if you decide that which i think is a kind of beautiful choice are people still going to feel resentful sometimes and, and what happens if everyone else's quality of life decreases because people keep having children or what if somebody wants to go somewhere else or how are they going to be able to buy out their share there's just all of these kind of little things um, I think they're better problems. I mean, this is really the argument that I make in the book is we have great problems now because we have just these vast inequalities. We have so much, um, uh, the, the model that we have requires constant growth, which, you know, as, as the uh, economist Kenneth Boulding said, right, if you think you can have infinite growth on a finite planet, you're either a madman or an economist. Mm -hmm. And all right, it's just it's it's kind of insane. You cannot keep growing on a world that can't sustain it. Um, and I think that's I mean, maybe this is some of the obsession with outer space at the moment, but um, I don't think that will will solve the problem. In, in any case, right, the models that we have are destructive of our natural world because they need to take more than is available. And we, we see this day, day by day. So my sense is that 
a, a world that really figures out how is it market based um, or is it kind of a democratic socialism that uses a market and distributes resources that way is it more kind of flat and, and we sort that out is it a group of cooperatives that compete together or that work together is it a whole giant I don't know I find these issues quite quite interesting um, but if you can if we can find ways to make sure that our, our basic global needs are met um, I think that people could stop doing things like saying uh, well, you know, we're Exxon Mobil and we have X hundred billion dollars of uh, untapped oil reserves on our balance sheet. And so no matter what, we're going to use them. Um, that, that claim doesn't make that much sense in a, in a democratic socialist world, right? So you can start to kind of deal with some, some of these, these issues. On the other hand, I don't know, you know, energy is, is still going to be like solar power is not going to be able to create steel anytime soon. You know, there is still going to be rather profound complexities in a world that works better um, for more people. And so I just, I want us to be honest about that. I try to lay out kind of a handful of them in a somewhat patchwork uh, way. But yeah, I mean, that's my sense. I don't, I don't know your, your guys's politics or, or um, what you, you know, if you have, a, it sounds like Leon, you have some other concerns. I just, I kind of wanted this book to be almost like a Trojan horse. Someone described it to me the other day. And I was like, yeah, that's, it's like, I'm gonna kind of bring you in like, yes, let's have a good enough life and like have decency and care and okay, well, what's the economy that's gonna get us there? And I didn't, I didn't mean to say, this is a book that's basically a political argument, um, but that it's really making an argument about what kind of world do we wanna see? And then asking, well, what kind of social order will get us there? And the best answer that I could come up with was something like a cooperatively driven world. Um, and how that works out and, and what the, the details are, I think are something I'd like to see more, more ink spilled on, right? So much of economics now is really about tinkering with numbers and how do you finance particular things. And there's not, I think, and I think there's probably more work than I know about, but there isn't a general mainstream push to really, okay, like what we want is an economy that works well for everybody. So how do we get there? Right? Right. What we have is a kind of, we have an economy that we know in order to, get rid of inflation, we're going to have to put some people out of work. Like, I mean, this is the kind of thing that's said more or less standardly, or, or um, some people, I mean, there was some, I think it was Laura Ingram, you know, Fox News, who was saying, if we raise wages, or if, if we give people unemployment, they won't want to work, right? They need to have to be able to starve in order to have them do the crappy jobs that we need people to do to make the economy function. I don't think that sentence should ever be said, right? But I think that is the kind of thing that, that drives our, our world. And how do we get out of that? And mm -hmm. I may not have the best answer to that, but that's that's where my my push is coming from for a kind of more cooperatively driven space. And I sometimes call it, sorry, the only other thing I'll say is that I think economic democracy, which is a term that has been used in the past, can be a slightly more um, open way of saying this. I think people have various reactions. You, know, you say socialism, people think of things that I don't associate really with socialism, but I understand, right? That, experiments in the past to make more egalitarian societies went terribly wrong. I talk about this in the book. Um, so I totally understand that. But right, if we talk about economic democracy, what we're really saying is we want, just as we want, right, everyone to have a vote and a say in, in society, we want everyone to kind of be a meaningful part of the economy. That's part of your rights um, as a citizen. Um, and that when the economic democracy falls apart, so do, too does the political democracy. And the United States is just an amazing example of that where the amount of power, you know, if you really want to change the world, don't be a politician, you know, be the Koch brothers, right? This is where, this is where power is held, it's held with money. Um, and so democracy itself starts to fall if we don't have a kind of proper economic democracy. Yeah. yeah what comes to mind is like when you have a, uh, I don't remember the exact name of like, um, there was a, wow, I can't believe I forgot the name of it. So it was in the Michael Moore documentary. I think it was, was it where to invade next? I don't know, something like that. So there was a, a cooperative that he essentially explored. And the idea was that, so it was a group of workers. They all obviously kind of worked together and they pretty much, they voted on everything, on all of the different policies. So you still had a CEO. So it wasn't black and white. It wasn't like, okay, there's either a CEO or there's no CEO. So you still had a CEO, but the CEO would pretty much, number one, implement the decisions. And number two is because he's considered like the head, he would in some way be given um, more of a kind of share of time, like to be able to, yes, it was that capitalism 
a love story. I think that was one interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, that wasn't. Yeah. So and, and I think, yeah, you're right. Wow. So um, yeah, so the CEO pretty much he had, I think, more time to kind of like uh to sort of espouse his ideas and to convince the sort of other people who worked at these cooperatives or at this particular cooperative, like what why they should implement particular policies. But at the end of the day, the idea was going back to Michael Shermer's idea of good ideas beating bad ideas. If he didn't have a good idea, according to kind of the group of people, then you know it was just not gonna be implemented. Mm -hmm. And then with the CEO, he was, I think, making something like maybe not, I don't know if he was making double, maybe double, maybe he was making double the average worker, but it wasn't 30 times, right? Like pretty much what you're getting now. So what I like about that idea is it's sort of a mix of communism or whatever, let's say socialism. It's a mix of capitalism and socialism where you still have a CEO, you still have a person who's considered to be, let's say the smartest, right? But that doesn't mean what we normally think it means. So just because someone is the smartest, going back to that sort of platonic ideal of philosopher kings, it doesn't mean he gets to rule over everybody else or she, right? The idea is just because you're the smartest, we'll probably give you more weight in terms of your arguments. We'll probably listen to them more intently. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be we're only listening to you and then everybody else is kind of down here. We don't care about what they have to say. Where the idea is like, yeah, we'll pay you more and we'll pay you more to implement our policies. But our policies collectively are what matter, not what one person thinks above all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also sometimes, you know, you think about making double what somebody makes, right? Like if you're making $80,000 a year, everyone in the company, and then the CEO is making $160,000. Like that is a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we think, you know, like some CEOs, I mean, sometimes 30 times is not that much these days, right? Some companies have two, like JC Penney, I think when they collapsed, the CEO was making 2,000 times all those paperwork. Wow. And there's all these kind of insane uh, numbers out there. That's a great, I haven't seen that, that uh, particular documentary. Um, I should watch it because that sounds, that sounds like a nice story that really captures um yeah like this again it's not a perfect model but it it lets everyone have a say and it maybe you know someone who has a particular skill maybe gets rewarded a little bit for that skill but not too much it sounds like a very very kind of proper good enough uh example yeah Right. And again, it goes against idealistic thinking, because when we think about like socialism and uh, I think maybe this is like one final thing or closer to the final, you know, sort of the final end of this podcast. But one final thing that we talk about is this sort of idea of um, so when we're thinking about like communism and so that's utopic thinking. Right. So when we're thinking about like the communist state, what ended up happening is even though like collectively everybody made the same amount, the positional economy was obviously a little bit different. Right. Or a lot different where you had this idea of there was some um, oh, it was called like the Politburo. Um, mm -hmm. And so the idea, yeah, so the idea there was that you had this group of elites that even though, and even though technically, man, they might've not made more money, but they had more resources. So one way or another, like, uh, it, they had more, they had more possessions. So they, again, and maybe their salaries were like, you know, whatever, let's say in, in kind of um, in comparison, like to, you know, whatever the average worker was making, but they still possess more resources, right? So what you have in that respect is you have like, you know, again, communism is very idealistic and the idea is like, no man is above anybody else and we're all the same. And I think what happens in that kind of utopic thinking is somewhere down the line, probably even sooner rather than later, it all kind of falls apart and you see that people are going to take advantage of it. But what I like about the system that Michael Moore presented was that like, no, no, it's objectively so that some people have a little bit more status and a little bit more money resources, right? Or more, more, more of an income than let's say the rest of us. Whereas like with communism, I, it feels like as though they were hiding it, where the idea is like, no, 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 no. Even though we're the government, we're not really the government, right? We're just allocating resources for the workers. That's not what they were doing. They weren't doing that at all. If anything, again, going back to the idea of the Politburo, they were literally allocating resources to themselves with the guise or in the guise of you know, kind of workers' rights and uh, what's it called, whatever, just like the benefits of like, you know, international socialism. But in this case, where again, we're talking about good enough, it's sort of out in the open. There's not really any guesswork. So when we're talking about cooperatives that have a CEO, it's like, you don't have to wonder like, okay, who's trying to kind of subvert power and um, who's sort of trying, or so who's trying to take power and sort of subvert, you know, the average person. Well, really the answer is nobody because in some way the CEO probably feels like he or she has enough and then everybody else feels the same way. Whereas when you have the system where just complete egalitarianism, again, utopianism, and then you, you 
you're going to have people who are like, oh, well, you know, this isn't fair. If we work for the government, we deserve a little more. And, you know, and I was thinking about it just in terms of the political economy where the idea, not the political, um, what was the other one? What was the economy um, of status? What did you call it? Really attention economy or positional yeah. economy? Positional economy, yeah. So when you're thinking of positional economy and like, let's say that I think if it's not in the forefront, what's going to happen is somewhere in kind of the back end, it's going to creep in and people are going to want more status. Mm. So yeah. No, for sure. And I think it's really important that we take positional economy issues seriously. And I, mean, I think it's something that you sometimes hear from kind of right leaning people, some, you know, this kind of um, front row America, back row America uh, kind of idea, right, that people have kind of missed out or they don't feel like they're involved. And I think I disagree in terms of who, who right, there's sometimes ideas about people of what um, race or gender or whatever nationality should be involved. And, and that I think is a sticking point. But in terms of the basic idea, right, that it, you know people are going to get upset, societies are going to crumble if people really feel like they don't have any position. Um, that's true, right, and, and that's something that should be taken seriously. It just has to be said. The reason, right, that like um, white people in, in the United States might feel like they have decreasing amounts of power is not because of of changing you know racial demographics. It's because of wealth and power being concentrated into fewer hands, right? And so this, you know, this is kind of clear ploy, but. I think, right, the way to speak across that divide um, is to really say, actually, we're, we're kind of, we're talking about the same thing here, right? We're talking about the loss of power within, within this positional economy. How do we get that so that, right, there is something like a kind of decent functioning democracy where we're, we're, all, we're all able to have a say and, and be part of it. Um, in terms of the, the yeah, I, I, so we, you know, kind of system, and, and I think it's true that you know, when you look at a lot of revolutionary movements, one of the sad things that happens is that people come in saying, I'm going to take over and then I'm going to make this kind of proper egalitarian society. And then they kind of just take everything for themselves and their, and their cronies. And um, that I think is why it's better to come in and say, you know, I know it's not quite as inspirational a message, but you know, come and say, I'm not going to make everything perfect, but, you know, we're going to all going to have decent lives and I'm going to be president. So, like, I'm going to make a little more than you, but I'm only going to be in for a few years, I promise. And, and you know, we'll keep the elections and, you know, you're not going to be that happy with everything I do, uh, but I'm going to really do my best. And I think, you know, someone like Pepe Mujica, like, had, I think this is some of his his vibe in Uruguay, like this, you know, kind of... Um, you know, he, he lived in his little house that he'd lived in his, his whole life. And, you know, it was a pretty nice little farm, but he didn't take the presidential palace. And he often said, look, there's international development issues. I'd like to do more, but I can't print money out of thin air. You know, he was a really earnest, serious guy. There's a great um, short documentary about him. Uh, I forget what it's called. Maybe just Pepe. Um, but, that, I, you know, and, and I think that that to me, I find like a slightly more that to me is very inspirational, that kind of honesty and, and earnestness um, more so than what I think you see, which is I'm going to make everything great. Just put me in power and everything's going to be great. And then you see, actually, of course not. Right. That, that gets subverted and, and lost. And so I think some humility, some self-doubt. Um, some sense of one's own good enoughness, right? That we really are not like the best or the perfect uh, can help us to, to be more grounded and, and more available, uh, even in positions of power. Um, and also to rethink, right? How do we, how do we diffuse power a bit in society? And, and how do we have more people be involved in different kinds of democratic projects? Uh, so yeah, I very much appreciate where you're, where you're coming from there. I love that, man. So, and that makes me think of, and this is, I think, a good point to end it off on. Uh, there's a William Blake a quote from his poem where he said, the iron fist that crushed the tyrant's head became a tyrant in its stead. Wow. So, yeah, right. So that's what tends to happen, man, especially when we're thinking of like these revolutions, like these people, again, utopic visions, but they're like, I have the answers, make America great again. So, all right, Alan, final, final thoughts, questions. What's up? Yes. Uh, so, Avi, if we if we wanted to find you, find your work, uh, wh where could we follow you? Um, I have a, so I go by Avi. Uh, my my like writer name is Avram. So if you look for Avram Alberts, uh, AvramAlbert.com, it's not very frequently updated. I'll, but I'll make sure to put a link to this. Uh, and I am a terrible Twitter user, but I'm 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 learning, doing my best. Um, so you can, you can definitely find me there, but I'm also just very easy to find. If you look on my website, there, there's an email there and I respond to pretty much every email I receive unless they're like particularly cool. And then 
coming out of it. It doesn't happen that often, but sometimes you get these just kind of like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I really feel like I have time for everybody, but then sometimes there's these moments of this is it's not going to end well. But uh, anyway, try me if you want to send a cruel email if you hear this. Send yeah. it out. I'll do my best. Yeah. And remember, <laughs> as Rick Rubin said, great art is divisive. You either love it or you hate it. So the more haters you have, the better you're doing, man. Yeah, there you go. I just want to do good enough, though. You know, so it's all right. <laughs> I hear you, man. All right, Avi, thank you so much for coming so on, much. man. This is such a wonderful episode. Thank, thank you. you, guys. That was really fun. I really appreciate your, your questions and your kind of vibe together. It was really kind of nice to have a triangular conversation. So, yeah, thank it was really great. Thank you. We'll talk, we'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. So, first of all, time flew. I know, right? That was when you said, oh, what are my final questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I looked at the time like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. We had to let him go at some point. <laughs> right. Well, everyone, uh, again, this is the book, The Good Enough Life, Avram Alpert. You can find it on Amazon, other book retailers. Uh, we'll also have a link in the description. And if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. We're, on, uh, we're at Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. And everyone uh, keep seizing the moment. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.